Hello and welcome to Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us today as we delve into the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. I'm grateful that you have joined us in this study, and if you're just joining us for the first time, I encourage you back up to the first chapter of Revelation and begin there. We lay a groundwork for understanding the layout and the way things interweave through the book of Revelation that will will benefit you as you journey through it. Um, But we're grateful to have you with us. I'm grateful you have joined us for the study of God's Word, and I pray that you will speak to your heart and your life today through His Word and that it will instill in you a desire for his word, a desire to hear his voice and to follow him with your life. Thank you for joining us today. Let me lift you in prayer as we begin this time of study together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the many blessings you have given us, the greatest of which is Christ, who atoned for our sin, who provides forgiveness for us, covering us with his own righteousness and giving us access into your presence, giving us a right relationship with you, giving us eternal life, giving us victory that is yours. Now, Father, as we study this book of Revelation today, help us to study it with open hearts, with discerning ears, that we would hear your voice, that we'd sense your spirit prompting our hearts, and that we would take from your word what you have for us there, and we would live it out in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your word, both the written word and your word in the flesh, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, as you are joining us today, we are delving into this, the 18th chapter of Revelation. And I have to do kind of a side note here and say that the 18th chapter, although it is part of that uh, 17 through 19 that describes the fall of Babylon, and here Babylon being understood as symbolic of Rome, but also archetypal for all nations that stand in opposition to God and become enamored with their own power, their own might, their own wealth, their own commerce, and whose people have placed their faith in those things instead of the one true God. So when we describe Babylon, it's referring to all of those things. And it's descriptive of many things. As John is writing this book, it's descriptive of Rome. It Rome is is carrying out that archetypal existence of Babylon that Babylon symbolized. So as we're digging into this, we've made it to the 18th chapter. 17 dealt some with it. 18 deals with it more, but 18 also presents it to us in the form of seven songs. And maybe in our day and age, that seems a little odd, although musicals are becoming more popular. Even some TV shows do an episode that's musical. Well, I'm not going to sing this chapter to you because I have no idea how it goes and you wouldn't want to listen to me sing it anyway. But it is broken down into seven songs that relate to the fall of Babylon. And they're songs that are, are led by these angelic beings that make these heavenly proclamations. And we're going to take this by sections. We're going to deal with the first and the second song, and then we're going to take three through five of the songs together because they're actually laments over the fall of Babylon by different individuals. And then we get to the seventh, which is the the judgment and the announcement of that judgment and its duration against Babylon or Rome or any nation that stands placing its faith and its military might and its commerce and its luxury and wealth security instead of a nation that places its faith in the Lord. And so let's pick apart the sections of this and try to really grasp what is going on and what God is revealing through his angels in this vision to John as he has inspired John to pen it for us. Let's look at chapter 18. 
The 18th chapter starts out this way. It says, After all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. Again, there that that brightness and his splendor, um, those are references to God's glory, the radiance of God's glory. And it just makes it clear that this angel that comes down from heaven isn't speaking for himself. He is a messenger. It's what Angelos, the Greek word, means, messenger. But he is a messenger for God. And that's why he radiates this shine, this, this glory, um, this splendor of God's presence, because he is carrying the message of God. So hear what he says. He gave a great shout, verse 2. He gave a mighty shout. And here's the first of the songs. Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. Now, foul there is, is a reference to ceremonially unclean. So these, this is just a description of there is nothing good um, and it's not fit for anything good after its destruction. And the, he's announcing it like it's already happened. Babylon has fallen. Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. Verse three, for all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of this world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of this world have grown rich. So what's he describing? He's describing this city that has fallen. And that fallen is is a description of God's judgment on it. And we'll get into that more as we go through this chapter. But in that description, he talks about how it is her sin that has brought this about, how even though there's there's desolation not fit for anything except foul spirits, unclean spirits, unclean vultures, unclean and dreadful animals. But then he says, for all the nations have fallen. All the nations have fallen. Why? Because they associated with Babylon, because they were were hanging on to Babylon. They were enjoying what they could of all of these different ungodly aspects of Babylon. Now, am I saying commerce is ungodly? No, unless it's done apart from obedience to God. Am I saying, you know, military might's ungodly? Well, that all depends on how it's used and is it subject to the rule of God? Um, Is merchants, are are merchants a problem? Mm, Only only in so much as they feed the basic lusts of humanity. But a merchant that that carries on his enterprise for the glory of God and to advance the kingdom's agenda, then no, there's not a problem there. But when we look at Rome, Babylon, there was definitely a problem. And we're really going to get into that in a minute. But those that were hanging on suffered as did she. The judgment was on her, but it spills over to those that are guilty of associating with her sin and partaking in her sin. There's a warning there for believers, and it's a warning that comes out in the second song as well, that as believers, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. When we start identifying so much with the lost and fallen world, that we're indistinguishable from the lost and fallen world, then we need to understand the judgment coming on the fallen world may spill over to us. Because in our heads, we may think we're okay. But in reality, we've chosen to worship those things instead of God. And you can say, yeah, but I went down the aisle in the church when I was six and I... Yeah, but do you know Christ as your Savior and Lord? Not did you go through some actions in a church? Or I was confirmed when I was... I'm not asking if you went through some action in the church. I'm cautioning you, as John was, as Christ was through John to the early church in Asia Minor, there's great temptation to align yourself with the easy life. But it's not what God is calling you to. 
And if you make that choice to let luxury, to let comfort, to let your desires become the God that rules your life, then that becomes the God you worship and you do not follow Christ. You may have flirted with following Christ for a while, but that's not who you are relying on. That's not where you find your life. You find your life over here in Babylon. And if so, be warned, because Babylon's day of falling, Babylon's judgment is coming. And if you're associated with Babylon, it's coming for you too. So be tied to Christ. Be united with Christ. It may mean you will face hardship. It may mean that you will face want in your life. But you have the victory. You are an overcomer in Christ. Hang on to him above all else. Hang on to him. Well, let's keep going because we're about to look at the second song. In the second song, there is a call to flee from Babylon, a call to get away, a call to get back. You know, you're, you're, you're in the, if you will, I've got a friend that calls it the splatter zone of God's judgment. You know, if you're standing next to the guys that get swallowed up by the burning hole in the ground, you don't want to be standing too close to them because you might fall in too, you know, or uh, some such thing. If we're going to look Exodus type judgment. It says, then I heard another voice, verse four, then I heard another voice calling from heaven, come away from her, my people, do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her for her sins are piled as high as the heavens and God remembers her evil deeds. So God may be slow to bring judgment on Babylon, on Rome, but it doesn't mean he's not going to, and it doesn't mean he's not aware of all of it. In fact, this is a proclamation that judgment is coming and believers are encouraged to separate themselves, not necessarily flee from Rome, the city, but do not take part in the sins of Rome or Babylon or Edom or Tyre and Sidon or any number of nations that represent this standing against God. Verse five again, for her sins are piled as high as heaven and God remembers her evil deeds Do to her as she has done to others, double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others. So brew twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury. So match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore, these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. Now that's a proclamation of God's judgment on this nation and a call for believers to be different, to be distinct, to be separate, to come out from her, to not be associated with her sin because the judgment is coming and it's going to be big. And it is a judgment that is in response to the terror that she visited on others for her own amusement and her own benefit. It is going to be a judgment that comes because of her, her love for sin about how she had the opportunity as all humanity does to worship God. And she chose to turn away and worship gods she had made. Don't join in. And you may say, well, this is kind of harsh, you know, see that the, the judgment on her is, is twice what she did. Is that fair? Oh yeah. Um, and the reason for this judgment is partially stated there. Part of it is because of the torment and the terror she has visited on others. 
Remember, this is written to the churches of Asia Minor, many of which are suffering extreme persecution under Roman rule at this point. Some are living in luxury, and it's a warning to them. But for the churches that are suffering under the crushing heel of the Roman boot, they are encouraged by this. There is vindication. There is justice for the blood of the martyrs that cries out from under the altar in the throne room of God. There is justice. There is justice. God is a just God. He's also a loving God because any one of these people can turn to him in faith and receive forgiveness for sins. There's still justice. You may say, well, somebody still needs to pay for that evil that was done. There are only two options on that front. God has offered in Christ Jesus to pay on our behalf, or we can pay ourselves. The message of the gospel is we don't have to pay ourselves for our sin. Christ has already done it. And if we will accept his sacrifice on our behalf, if we will confess to him that we are sinners and ask him to save us, he will. Scripture tells us, call on the name of the Lord. You will be saved. Now, call on the name of the Lord doesn't just mean call out Jesus' name, but it means placing your faith, your trust, your hope in him, finding forgiveness in him. But if you don't find your forgiveness in Christ, you don't live under that forgiveness that he paid for your sins, then you're faced with paying for them yourself. And again, Paul over in Romans is real blunt. He says the wages of sin is death. The wages of Babylon or Rome's sin is death. And that's what's coming. And just to be sure that this is God's hand at work, it's coming in the form of plagues. Yeah, like Old Testament plagues. In fact, he says, in verse 8, therefore these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death, mourning, and famine. Just boom, it's going to hit. And it is the judgment of God on her. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. That's the second song. That song calling on believers to flee, to not be associated with her sin, to be separate and distinct to be the people of God. Elsewhere in Scripture, we're described as strangers and aliens in this world. Corinthians describes us as ambassadors for Christ in this world. Not part of it. In it, not of it. Now we get to verse 9. And verse 9 and, and several of the ones following are a series of three songs. It's, I said we take songs number three through five together, and we are at this point. They are laments by different groups of people associated with Babylon, Rome. Um, it's going to be the kings, the political rulers. It's going to be, um, yeah. If you ever wonder if I go blank sometimes, this is one of those times. Uh, it's going to be kings. It's going to be merchants. That's right. It's going to be merchants and it's going to be sailors. Uh, those three groups are the ones that are all mentioned here as being associated with Rome. They, Rome. they weren't actually part of it, but they facilitated and they benefited from. So let's look at what it says in these laments, starting in verse nine. And the king's of the world who committed adultery with her and had enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment, and they will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city! In a single moment, God's judgment came on you. 
So there was the kings and their lament, their cry, because Rome was their security. Rome was what they took part in. They were part of the political and military structure of Rome, and they saw the benefits and the luxuries that were associated with that. They're not really lamenting the fall of Babylon or Rome here. They're lamenting the fall of their own connection. But it goes on. We get the song of the merchants in verse 11. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She bought great quantities of, and there's a lot of stuff listed here. We'll come back and talk about that. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thine wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood and bronze and iron and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies, that is, human slaves. Verse 14, their song. The fancy things you love so much are gone, they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. Now I'm going to stop there and, and look at that list. All those things, whether you're dealing with the gold, silver, jewels, fine linen, expensive wood, iron, marble, bronze, so on and so forth, or you're talking about cinnamon, incense, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chair. These are all highly valuable items. These are all big ticket. I mean, these are merchants talking. These are all big ticket sales here. And what the merchants are lamenting isn't the fact that Babylon, aka Rome, is not going to be there buying these things anymore. So they're going to suffer because they don't have them. This is the merchants lamenting their own situation. They no longer have customers. And there's one of these points I want to emphasize. The last one. Horses, chariots, and bodies. That is human slaves. Pointing out that that's part of the sin that it was that decadence and that luxury, that, that, that sense of importance and authority that feels that it's okay to subjugate others for your own pleasure and benefit. A uh, little hint here, it's not okay. Now, is slavery a foreign concept to the Bible? No, actually, it existed in the Old Testament. The Jews practiced slavery, although they had very specific rules on practicing slavery and after a period of time had to uh, give the option of the slaves to go free. Um, so it's, it's an interesting dynamic in the way it's set up in the Old Testament. Why is it set up that way? Well, in large part, because who were the Hebrew peoples in Egypt? slaves. Yeah. Um, so they knew how being a slave in a system that was set up so poorly or so oppressively could be. But the Romans, the Romans took slaves from conquered peoples and they sought to conquer everybody. They took the resources, they took the, the wealth, they took everything. They plundered everybody they conquered for the benefit of Rome. Um, they took people, the slave markets at Rome. Some historians estimate that the, the quantity of people moving through the slave market, uh, across the board in Rome may have represented as much as get this as much as 20% of the population. Let that sink in for a moment. When the Romans would come into a a village or somewhere that had rebelled against them, they would, and you've heard this term before, they would come in and they would decimate that people. You may think, oh, that means wipe them out. Actually, no. It's a Latin term and it means 10th. 
they would go in and they would line everybody up and they'd go down the row. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And number ten died, was executed. One, two, three, four, five, six, you know, and every tenth person was put to the sword. That's what it is to decimate. That's a tenth. That was their punishment as a people for rebelling. Now, if the slave market took up as much as 20% of the population of the people, that's not a tenth. That's 20% of the population served as slaves in Rome. Why? For the extravagance and the luxury of those that owned them. God is not okay with that. And he makes it clear that is part of the outflow of her adultery. Part of the outflow of her worshiping other gods and not the one true God. That is part of the outflow of seeking to serve our own desires, our, our drive for luxury, our drive for opulence, for wealth, for accumulating stuff. And there is a price for it. And it doesn't just do damage to us. It does damage to others as well. And there is judgment. That's what the merchants are lamenting. <clears throat> They've lost their best customer. They don't have anybody else to buy their merchandise. So it means their doom as well. Verse 11 picks up talking more about the merchants. It says, The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and fine pearls, fine linen, purple silk, scarlet cloth, things made of... I've already read this part, haven't I? Well, I'm going to read it again. Things made from fragrant thine wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood, bronze, iron, marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies, that is, human slaves. Verse 14, the fancy things you loved so much are gone, they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. And then 15, the, uh, the merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out. What are they crying out? Well, that's verse 16. How terrible, how terrible for that great city. And she was clothed in the finest purples and scarlet linen, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment, all the wealth of the great city is gone. A reminder there. In a moment, all of the trappings, in a moment, all of the stuff, in a moment, all the things we chase after that are not God will be gone. Gone in a moment. The comfort of our homes, if you make that God in your life, understand it can be gone. The assurance of a regular paycheck and of resources to buy what we consider the necessities of life can be gone in a moment. Anything we place before God can be gone in a moment. But God will never leave us or forsake us. We have assurance in Him. He is faithful. And His faithfulness isn't dependent on our faithfulness. He is faithful. He will never be gone in an instant. And this is written as an encouragement to those believers, those ones called out from Babylon or Rome. 
to distance themselves from her sin and to hold fast to Christ. Are you holding fast to Christ? Well, verse 18 continues on this way. It says, And all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. So now we've moved into another lament, and this is the lament of the sailors. It says, They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend, and they will say, Where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads and show their grief, and they will cry out. So the kings are crying out. The merchants are crying out. The sailors are crying out. Why? Because they had built their lives around Babylon, Rome. Now, the Roman Empire, as it it grew and, and ascended to its peak, the Roman Empire brought peace and security to shipping in the Mediterranean. Uh, There previously had been trouble with pirates and things of that nature. And no, I'm not talking about the pirates you're thinking of. We're going back further than that. Um, And the Romans cleared all that out and provided security and safety and standard routes and, and everything else for the flow of commerce and people. And so the kings that were associated with Rome benefited. The merchants benefited and the sailors benefited tremendously. And so now we get their lament. And as we pick up in the second half of 19, we hear what they say. How terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transporting her great wealth on the seas in a single moment. It's gone. Do you hear the sense of suddenness in each of these laments? Everything was great. Everything was going well. And suddenly it's gone. We like to think in our world that things just kind of roll on and they may change a little as they're rolling, but that there aren't these sudden moments. And here we're reminded that with God, there is judgment. There are those sudden moments where the price becomes due for our sin. Those moments where we will reap what we have sown. And those moments happen suddenly. Again, where do you place your faith? Do you place it in those things that can suddenly be gone? Or do you place it where it is secure? Song number six picks up in verse 20. And it says this, Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and people of God and apostles and prophets, for at last God has judged her for your sakes. What? That seems kind of contrary, doesn't it? As as we think about seeing the suffering and calamity that comes on others in this world, isn't there a part of our hearts that just goes out to them to see that sense of loss and that sense of suffering? I mean, maybe we're not as connected as the kings or the merchants or the the, uh, sailors, But we can just see what's going on in our world and go, oh, man, that's awful. I want to do something to make things better for them. And the reality is sometimes that's God's hand at work. Through a calamity, through a disaster, through through famine, through plague, Sometimes it is sin reaching maturity and facing godly judgment. Now, am I saying that every, you know, tornado or earthquake or whatever that happens is is God's judgment? No. But I'm saying we can't place our security in anything but him. 
And we need to trust him in the midst of what's going on, whether we understand it or not. And we need to understand that if we truly care about people, we are going to share the message of the gospel with them because it is the only thing that is going to change their eternity. Our job is to help change eternity for the people we meet. Now, God does the saving, but he's called us to carry the message And we have to be faithful in that. And we have to understand those that reject the message of the gospel, those that reject Christ, will face judgment. And that's what they have chosen. And that sounds harsh. But the reminder of that angel from heaven singing this sixth song in chapter 18 Rejoice over her fate. Rejoice that Babylon has been defeated, that Rome has been defeated. Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and the people of God, and the apostles and the prophets. For at last God has judged her for your sakes. Remember, this book is written to persecuted believers being crushed by idol worship by Roman rule, by refusal to deny Christ, they are being persecuted. And God is saying, there's a judgment coming, and it's going to be sudden, and it's going to be thorough. And when it happens, rejoice, because it's for your sake. Uh, In our modern way of phrasing things, we might say, God is telling them, I've got your back. Place your trust in Him. And now we finally made it to song number seven. Song seven picks up in verse 21 and goes through the end of the chapter. And it says this, it's a song of Babylon's destruction. It says, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. Now, we're not talking a small millstone that somebody might have in there. We're talking the kind of community would have to to press out olives or wine grapes or or mill grain. We're talking a massive thing, Um, a thing that, that, that is devastatingly heavy. I mean, it crushes grain into flour, a millstone. So, mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a millstone and he threw it into the ocean and he shouted just like this the great city of babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again you take that giant millstone it seems so impressive and so mighty and the angel is able to pick it up and chunk it into the ocean and you get this plop and it's gone. It's sunk beneath the waves. Nobody's been swimming down there, pulling it back up. It's gone. Babylon, when it faces judgment, of course, Babylon here being symbolic of Rome, but any nation that fits the mold, Babylon will be judged. And when it happens, it'll be quick and it'll be over. And that will be it. There is no you know, the second Roman comeback, Babylon Returns, the sequel. I No, it's over. Judgment and then gone. Verse 22, the sound of the harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen and no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and they deceive the nation with your sorcery, or and you deceive the nation with your sorceries. In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of people slaughtered all over 
the world. And there the chapter ends. That last song of Babylon's destruction talks about all the things, the the normal life, the the ongoing things that they enjoyed and thought would continue forever have ceased and will never be again. And why? Your merchants were the greatest in the world and you deceived the nation with your sorceries. What sorceries? You led the nations astray from the worship of God. Now, that might have been through false belief, worship of idols. It could just as well be worship of luxury and comfort and a sense of security. Because Rome promised those things, too. That if you were aligned with Rome, your your fate was secure. You knew that you didn't have to worry about invasion by another country because the Roman military would protect you. You knew that you could buy what you needed because the Roman merchants would see to getting you whatever you wanted. There was a sense of security and peace, but it was false. Because at any moment, and in fact in the moment of God's judgment, it all ceases permanently. Why? Because in that sense of comfort, that sense of security, that sense of strength, they didn't tolerate those that carried a different message. They, well, verse 24, in your streets flow the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people and the blood of people slaughtered all over the world. We, as followers of Christ, in this earthly existence, may die for our faith. Or we may suffer for our faith. But we will be victorious. Those who reject Christ, that seem to be in comfort now, that seem to have security and peace have no guarantee. Well, they have no guarantee it'll continue. They actually have a guarantee it won't continue. There will come a moment. What is that moment? That moment is the great and terrible, as Isaiah describes it, day of the Lord. Great for the people who know Christ and place their faith in him. Terrible for all the rest. Because the cost of their sin, the judgment of their sin, the wages of their sin will be visited upon them. This is a chapter full of songs that point out the different aspects of some of what the judgment of God flowing forth looks like. Some of what the cost of of placing our faith, our hope, and our trust in something other than in Christ costs. And there will be justice. It is coming. And this chapter is an assurance to God's people that the justice of God is coming. He's taking a while, and that's on purpose, but he has not forgotten. And he will hold to account So trust him. If you know Christ already, trust him. Find your security and peace in Christ, not in anything else, because everything else can be gone in an instant. If you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, understand his invitation is still open to you to turn to him, to call on his name, to place your faith and trust in him. And then you can be part of those rejoicing. Rejoicing that God is just and He has paid the price on our behalf. Where do you place your faith, your security, your hope? I pray that it's in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do again thank you. We thank you that you offer us salvation and right relationship with you. 
And Lord, we acknowledge that it is so easy to become enamored with the things of this world, distracted by the things of this world, enticed by the things of this world. Yet, Lord, we pray that you would give us a strength of heart and a strength of faith that would help us to stand, not to be lured away and also to endure persecution because we are not lured away. And Father, we know your judgment is coming and it is a just judgment on those that have rejected you. But Lord, we pray that you would open doors, that you would give give a sensitivity to the hearts, a conviction to the hearts of those that do not know you, that they might respond when we are faithful and share the gospel, that their eternities might change as well, that they would not be the ones experiencing this judgment and lamenting this loss but that they would find their victory, their gain, their security in you. Lord, we turn to you in all of this, and we thank you for your word as you have given it to us, as this was an encouragement to believers and a call to faithfulness to believers there in the early church. Lord, we pray that it is today in our lives a call to faithfulness and a call to obedience. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.